Yeah. Is there anyone from Pittsburgh in the room? Native? Local? We have no experts. My parents are actually, we'll do a fun fact before we start. My parents are both in Pittsburgh, and I've been coming here since I was a little kid, but I've never spent time downtown. But we've always talked about the trams that go up the hill and down the hill across the river, and it's beautiful. And so that's where this tram comes from, the logo comes from. So if you, anyone's here and has free time, I recommend, it's a good tourist attraction. I can't say I've personally enjoyed it because I haven't done it yet, but I've heard great things. All right, good morning everyone. Welcome to DrupalCon day two. I am very excited to be here. Uh, great to have you all in the session. I know I'm competing with Dries during the public board meeting, so I appreciate you all being here. It's very hard to compete with him, so I appreciate the time this morning. I have a very exciting uh, honor to talk about all of the amazing things that Drupal is, and you know, we'll spend some time together. I'd like to make this a little bit interactive, so if you have questions, if you have feedback, if you've contributed to any of the things that I'll be talking about today, raise your hand. I'd love to give you a huge shout out and thank you for all that we've done to contribute to the amazing Drupal community. A quick note about me, I'm Tammy Perlstein. I'm a Principal Product Marketing Manager at Acquia. Uh, and a few fun facts, because you know, while we do work, we are still people. So I grew up in New England, and I've actually never gone skiing or snowboarding, so please don't hate me for that. Don't hold it against me. I'm more of a beach person, but I do find that it's a bit of a fun fact. Uh, I love to cook as well, so if anyone is a cook in the room, I love to share recipes learn from each other. Uh, the best recipe I have actually I learned from a friend of mine with native Italian parents and I now make the red sauce that he taught me back in college. So always great to share and learn from each other on that front. And I'm also a bit of a newbie to Drupal. I've only been at Acquia for about a year and a half. So still learning, still immersing myself and I like to think that this community with all of the incredible things that have come out of it, you know, there's always more to learn. So being at my first DrupalCon here with you all, I'm very excited to just learn and chat and make some connections that we can carry forward. Uh, and I'm always a resource for you at Acquia and otherwise. So if you need anything, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn and via email. So if any of you were at the Dries Note yesterday, you had the pleasure of hearing him talk about all of the innovation and jumping S-curves and the fantastic analogies that he used to describe you know, all the things that Drupal has accomplished as well. And I'll be following on that same theme, talking a lot about innovation today. Innovation across the market, innovation in Drupal's history, as well as innovative customers that are doing cool things and putting these innovation practices into uh, driving some business outcomes. And then finishing out with some innovation projects that are going on currently that you can lean into, that you can get involved in and contribute to as a community member. So jumping right into things, we'll take a look at the market as a whole and all the innovation that's come out over the last couple of years. And now I won't be going back to the time of the dinosaurs because that would be far too much to even try to cover in a session this morning, but we'll start off with another monumental year, which is 2001. Can anyone guess why I've picked 2001? Anyone have a guess? Good guess, a little farther back. It was actually the first year that Drupal was released to the public. So, very interesting, very monumental. The world was changed, you know, maybe not as big as dinosaurs, but I think that it's pretty cool. And we'll make it all the way from 2001 to 2023 today, and then we'll look a little bit forward as to what is coming out in the next couple of years, and even, you know, in the next couple of weeks. And what's really interesting is looking at 2001, you may think, wow, so long ago, so much has changed. And what's been really incredible about Drupal and actually pushed a lot of its longevity forward is that it's focused on a singular problem. And that problem is that individuals want to interact with the web and they want to deliver really great web experiences. You know, while that problem existed 22 years ago and it exists today while having enhancements added to it as well, that problem will still exist in 22 years from now. And as we're expanding across digital channels and embracing new channels, that focus has really, at the center of Drupal, really provided an opportunity to build a foundation upon for future innovation. And while it's not just that focus on a problem that's supported Drupal's success, 
It's also this commitment and dedication to innovation and moving at the speed of the market. So not being laggards or saying, you know, not looking forward. How do we look to what is new? How do we identify what that S curve is, as Dries was talking about, and jump on the bandwagon soon? And that commitment and dedication has really proven Drupal's longevity. So we'll take a look at 22 years. Uh, looking back at 2001, while this is a very overwhelming slide, it's meant to be, and while this doesn't even capture all the innovation across 22 years, I feel like this is a good call out with some landmarks that we can attach our ourselves to that provide some clarity around what we've seen over this time. So like I said, 2001, Drupal was, was released to the public. 2003, Safari and WordPress are launched. 2006, jQuery is available. 2007, the first iPhone came out. I know I was pining, I begged for the first iPhone. Uh, it was a, all the cool kids had it. Uh, 2008, the first Android phone is available as well, so following right on the tails of Apple. GitHub is launched, and responsive design is taking off, so big year, 2008. 2010, AngularJS is open sourced. From 2010 to 2013, we have Bootstrap 1.0 to 3.0. And then from 2011 to 2015, we have SparkCore becoming EmberJS, and then EmberJS 1.0 to 2.0. In 2012, Composer is released, humongous milestone. And in 23, React is open sourced. Moving into 2015, we have another big innovation year. We have GraphQL, JSON API releases, and the Apple Watch, which many of us have become super reliant on. I know I'm addicted to checking my steps, making sure I hit my milestones, and competing with all my friends. In 2019, PHP 8 is released. And in 2020, we have ChatGPT and AI changing the world, along with Drupal 9, also changing the world. 2022, we have Drupal 10. And 2023, we have Modic being re-released as an open source platform back into the community. So like I said, this is really just a snapshot and meant to depict over the course of time how much has truly changed, going from not having cell phones to having a internet, a web in your pocket, something that you can use everything for. I remember my math teachers, it's not a strength of mine, saying, you know, you really need to focus on math because you're never going to have a calculator in your pocket. And I laugh because we do. So it's good to take a moment to pause and reflect on how much innovation really has taken place. But like I said, don't hold me. I may have missed some innovative moments in your history that you think are really pivotal to your organizations or what you've used Drupal for uh, previously. But it's important to note that there is an expansion of these channels, right? Drupal was founded on the web platform mentality, the framework, and we really expanded across all of these channels, across Amazon, uh, Alexa's, the uh, IoT, digital signage, kiosk. I mean, there's the, it changes by the moment. So it's good to reflect on where we've come and where we're going. All this to say that innovation really is happening at a staggering rate, and we're at a pivotal time in history. So now that we've looked at the market and how it's progressed, it's even more impressive to remember Drupal's commitment uh, and what I mentioned at the beginning of this session, which is the problem that Drupal is focusing on and delivering those web experiences, which are expanding across digital experiences, and that commitment to innovate at the rate of the market. <coughs> and there have been massive advancements within Drupal itself over the last 22 years. So let's take a trip down memory lane. This is one of my favorite pictures of Dries in his dorm room, the sombrero on his head, young, sprightly, very excited. Uh, and as I said, 2001, Drupal was released to the public. The world would really never be the same. And initially, Dries built the software as a means for communicating with his friends. As you can see the picture here, chatting, hanging out, just a means to connect. And one year later, Drupal released to the world to let others extend the platform, contribute to the platform, and leverage it for you know, a multitude of uses. And with that, the Drupal open source community was born. And with one line of code written at a time, Drupal has become what it is today and really started to grow. So fast forward to 2007. This might be a little bit of a, a biased moment in history for me, but Drupal really hit the main stage when MTV came knocking on Dries' door asking for support to launch their new Drupal site. And huge MTV fan, personally, I was watching all the music videos growing up, so pretty cool fact about Drupal. But what this opportunity provided was actually a light bulb for Dries to say, hmm, 
think there's an opportunity for an enterprise to come in and leverage Drupal to expand and grow and provide a web experience for you know, a multitude of customers, a wide breadth of customers, and a diverse uh, amount of customers. And Acquia was born. And Acquia became what Red Hat did for Linux, uh, which is that it provides an opportunity to extend the power of Drupal and contribute that power back in uh, to the community. And Acquia remains the number one corporate community, the corporate contributor to Drupal today. In January 2011, Drupal 7 was released, which was a revolutionary release for Drupal, the biggest release up until this point. Uh, and it was really a revolutionary release for two reasons. Because of the size and the diversity of the community that was growing at an exponential rate, and also through the strong formation and coordination across usability, accessibility, and the design teams, Drupal 7 was able to address a lot of the accessibility uh, limitations that Drupal had had previously. This opened up Drupal to a wider audience and really pushed for that open web platform perspective, which we bring true and we talk about all the time today. So this really, like I said, was revolutionary for those two reasons uh, and really opens up the opportunity for a more diverse audience to start to use Drupal. But also in 2011, in July, DrupalCon assumed the formal name of the Drupal Association and began acting as a legal body to support Drupal.org. So since 2011, we all have seen what the Drupal Association has been able to accomplish by growing alongside the Drupal project. And the goal really of the Drupal Association is to make Drupal the biggest and most popular, most adopted CMS on the market. And they're doing that by aligning to the community needs and the project needs. And while the DA initially focused on incredible events, DrupalCon events like this one that we're at today, they're really hitting their stride in terms of what they're able to give back to the community, focusing on contributions and leveling up Drupal.org, focusing on community, community <coughs> cultivation grants, as well as global training days to really expand the breadth of Drupal users and the way that Drupal users are using it today. So I just want to say a big thank you to anyone who's a member of the DA or has, you know, we all contribute and we all experience the breadth of what they deliver to Drupal. So huge shout out to all they've accomplished and what they've been able to help to do support the community. And in November 2015, Drupal 8 is released. Is released. So this is the biggest update since you know the time of when it started. Um, and this really put forth Drupal as ahead of the market as a competitive open source CMS that everybody should be looking to, to deliver really innovative, innovative experiences. And it was ahead of the curve in terms of decoupled websites specifically, with built-in Rust API for all content, a system to query data from Drupal, a big pipe implementation, and improved content editing with WYSIWYG and Preview, this really changed the game for how users were leveraging a CMS. However, the decoupling revealed that there was a need to investigate uh, better ways to deliver data on the client side. So as pages and applications became more component driven, the complexity of the queries performed and the demand on those queries increased. So Sebastian Simpson proposed using Facebook's GraphQL to solve this challenge. And luckily for Sebastian, he was right. Because as we know, GraphQL, as a query language for APIs, makes this quite easy. It's able to evolve APIs over time, limit the number of round trips, and it enables powerful developer tools to expedite your workflows and make remove friction, make things more seamless. And today, GraphQL is an actively maintained and highly popular module. But by 2017, the CMS market was pretty busy. There were a couple key players. So it was hard to differentiate and stay ahead of the competition. However, unlike other CMSs, Drupal took the approach of being API first, not API only, which really set them apart from the competition. And an API first approach, as we're all familiar with, doesn't limit you to a coupled approach. And it also doesn't limit you to an API only approach. So it really enables you to leverage the best of both worlds. And it doesn't limit you to a 
only headless CMS that we have on the market today, and it doesn't limit you to some of those monolithic players that have been in the market for a long time. This was a major turning point for Drupal, as it can now be leveraged to support multiple architectures within your own organization or across organizations for a diverse set of needs and diverse use cases. So understanding your project, your requirements, who are your users, Drupal can really meet all of your needs. And on January 7th in 2019, all of the work from the previous three years on JSON API culminated in a JSON API 2.0 stable release. And the 2.0 release marked the start of the module's move to Drupal Core. And after countless review, countless improvements, the module was finally committed to Core. So a humongous, humongous accomplishment. It was a major milestone towards making Drupal API first. And it was no small accomplishment. Huge thanks to Wim, Gabe, and Matteo. It was a lot of work. From the beginning to the end, it took 28 months, 450 commits, 32 releases, and more than 5,500 test runs. And this is just yet another example of Drupal's commitment and dedication to delivering innovation that's game-changing, that's actually going to be applicable to your real-life projects, and giving back to the community so that other community members can leverage that innovation as well. And finally, in 2022, Drupal 10 was released, humongous excitement, and this is the newest major version of Drupal available today with some key innovative features. First, the Claro admin theme. It's a modernized backend with really fresh and updated look, and it actually replicates the power that Drupal holds. The previous themes did not necessarily depict or invite new Drupal users to leverage the power that Drupal has. So by updating the backend theme, this really invites new users to see and leverage the power of Drupal. The second is a sleek and modern Olivero default front-end theme. And as I'm sure we're familiar, this is a beautiful theme right out of the box, named after Rachel Olivero, a very committed Drupal community member to accessibility. And it features many accessibility enhancements for Drupal 10 that work for everyone. CK Editor 5 uh, is a refined content editor experience. And our starter kit theme generator for Drupal 10 as well. So as we know, Drupal themes are not usually built from scratch. They're built on top of a basic theme. And with starter kit in Drupal 10, you can create a fork from a compatible theme and work on your copy from there. Whichever version you copied from is automatically retained, and then you are then responsible and accountable to review and apply those changes, further enhancing stability. And lastly, Symfony 6.2 and PHP 8.1, these upgrades improve the Drupal experience by enhancing support, boosting site performance, and a more modern UX for developers who, uh, for UX developers and also non-technical users, so further expanding that audience again. So as we look to today, 2023, there are some pretty incredible accomplishments that I just walked through. And while I know that not everybody may uh, have all of the experience in Drupal, there's so much room to grow. And I wanted to call out a couple of stats here that I found really powerful. The first is that one in 10 sites today run on Drupal. And that is a mass massive accomplishment that I can't imagine Dries in his dorm room could have ever envisioned for Drupal. The second is that uh, we have over 50,000 contributed modules, increasing the extensibility of Drupal every single day. So thanks to our agencies, our partners, our community members that are constantly innovating and contributing back to the community so that others can leverage the same power uh, and apply in different practices as well. And the last is the diverse and inclusive community that Drupal has you know, grown and fostered through many years uh, promoting open web and accessibility for all. This is a major, major accomplishment to have a community that is you know, so interactive and engaged that we have events like DrupalCon all across the world. It's a testament to the dedication that each of the Drupal users and members feel and the loyalty that we have to Drupal. So I wanted to pause and say kudos to you all because this truly is a testament to the work that you all do. It's astonishing what we've accomplished in just 22 years. So I'm excited to see, no pressure, what happens in the next 22. So it's a lot. We've covered a lot of ground. There's a lot going on. I get it. 
Uh, but I wanted to just mention and reiterate the points that I mentioned before, which is the focus on the problem, needing to manage content, manage experiences across the web, and those new expanding digital channels, and the dedication to the rate of change in the market. Like I said, I can't imagine Dries in his sprightly college dorm thinking about all that has been accomplished, but it really is an incredible accomplishment. And while we've covered some really innovative moments, I think it's even cooler to talk about customers that are using this in practice and doing and delivering some really incredible experiences today. So I wanted to see if there are any New Yorkers. I know there's no native Pittsburghians, but any New Yorkers in the room? Anyone who's been to, kind of, okay. Anyone who's been to New York, visited New York, taken the MTA? Yes, we have a couple more people, yes. We don't necessarily want to live there, but we'd love to visit. Great to immerse ourselves for three days. I can't do more than three days, it's like Vegas. So if any of you have been to New York and you've experienced the MTA, you know that it is central to the city. It is the lifeblood of the city, if you will. As much as people want to walk, 40 blocks is not manageable. So the MTA set out to improve its customer experience and to create a cohesive user journey across all of their touch points and channels, which you might think for the MTA, they're not super innovative. They, they might not be doing that cool of stuff. You're very wrong. They were actually looking to provide every commuter with a unique experience across their platforms as they're looking to leverage MPA in, MTA in every single facet of their daily life, whether it's getting themselves to work, getting to you know, hang out with friends, getting to see family. I mean, it's really, like I said, the lifeblood. So by leveraging decoupled Drupal and Acquia solutions, the MTA can use digital signs across all of their locations, powered by centrally managed content in Drupal, to deliver a well-rounded customer experience. And to supply the digital signage, they really need to focus on delivering content, collecting content from third-party and external sources, and then pushing that content out in real time. And a great example of this is what they were able to do with their countdown clocks. So in order to do this, they had to collect data from Drupal as well as uh, other external services and collect that data and then in real time push it out. But they also needed to attach Bluetooth beacons to the trains themselves in order to ensure the accuracy of the arrival and departure times. So a pretty robust and complex project. But like I said, Drupal really acts as that gatekeeper of all of the content and data being able to pull in APIs and push out data and all that content uh, in that real time, which is you know when you're looking for a train and it says seven minutes and it's actually 15, that can derail your entire day. So as if this wasn't already a complex project, the MTA wanted to layer in a layer of automation. So with Drupal content modeling, the MTA was able to automate the distribution and management of transit messages tailored for each of their platforms. I want to pause because that is pretty epic. If you think about how many platforms, how many signs, how many countdown clocks are in New York, and you're able to deliver personalized data and content to that specific platform, that is a humongous speed. So very complex, very challenging, but they were able to do it. They also built their front end experience using React.js. So by adopting an approach that they call progressively decoupled Drupal, the MTA was able to build a React application within a Drupal theme. So the data displayed in the front end can still be informed by the Drupal content model while maintaining the flexibility of a decoupled solution. Like I said, they just really made this as complex as they possibly could, but they drove some really impactful results. So with Drupal, the MTA was able to streamline their content management across their digital signs, all of their stations to ensure an efficient and effective content update process. With Drupal as their single CMS, any user within their organization can go in and make those content updates. There's no relying on the development team to push out content updates in real time. That would cause friction, that would delay the real time nature of their countdown clocks and messaging. But most importantly, by infusing the power of digital signage into their station countdown clocks, the MTA is making their customers their priority. So the customers build loyalty with their organization and know that they can rely for trusted information. 
transit information, news, I mean, all of the things that come with travel, uh, especially in such a high volume and high stress environment. So they're really putting their passengers at the forefront of what they do and looking at what their passengers need from them. So they're really setting the precedent for how an organization, whether in transportation or in e-commerce or in gov, can take a perspective of how do I put my customer or my constituent or my passenger at the forefront of how I build experiences. And it's really a great example of how we can modernize an industry that you may not think might be the most innovative or the most cool or doing something that's unique and different. PAC-12 is another customer that I love to talk about. If you're familiar or unfamiliar, they are a collegiate athletic conference and they really wanted to connect their applications to provide an incredible customer fan, if you will, experience across their digital landscape. And they had a, an array of apps, but they really wanted to be the central source of truth. So for any games, any playoffs, uh, whether it's, you know, baseball or football or basketball or you name it, they wanted to be the hub for where you got information. But their challenge was that they had a ton of applications across iOS, Apple TV, Fire, Android, and they had just rebuilt their entire website, pack12.com. And applications present content that's super dynamic. It can be team schedules, video content, uh, information from their so social platforms. So it's really highly dynamic. It's changing all the time and changing almost in real time for games that say go into overtime that impacts the team schedule and connecting all of these apps was really a big challenge they were looking to overcome but it was really to deliver a accurate uh, experience for their fans so that their fans knew they could rely on the information they were receiving from pac 12. so pac 12 leveraged headless drupal in order to connect to and power its array of fan-facing applications leveraging the power of APIs. And Drupal really acts as that central nervous system, so powering everything that is externally facing for that fan experience, orchestrating various microservices and the flow of key data, uh, as well as uh, powering and in, in, in putting more of that content to make it more engaging. So the team was able to recreate a large number of custom APIs for their events, for their videos that were on demand, as well as their content utilizing REST endpoints to query GraphQL, as we mentioned before, and migrated and converted existing React components to improve their existing architecture and provide blocks for use in Layout Builder. What they delivered was truly astonishing. They were able to launch 3,000 plus landing pages for all of their Pac-12 conference events in just five months. That is a very large number of sites in a very short period of time for an organization like Pac-12. They were also able to migrate all of their existing video and can now host all of their pre-game, live, and post-game video on their site, which led to, in just the first year, doubling the number of hours that people viewed video content on their site. So when we look back at what their challenge and what their goals were, Pac-12 wanted to be that central hub for their fans. They wanted to be that central source. And with Drupal, in a decoupled fashion, they were able to achieve that goal. They were able to double the content, uh, the time that they were consuming content on their site for their fans. But that's just one metric that they used to measure that engagement. So as we're looking to leverage Drupal in a more innovative fashion, the theme that we're seeing run through here is putting your customer first and really understanding what they're looking for, how they want to consume the content, and how Drupal can help your organizations or you yourself to push out that content in a really dynamic way. So this is one of my favorite brands, and it's not my favorite brand because I'm a motorcycle enthusiast by any means, but I think it, they're doing something really cool and disruptive in the market. Uh, and for anyone, raise your hand if you're a motorcycle enthusiast. Yes, I have one in the back. So have you, are you familiar with Livewire at all? You are? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, they're awesome. Um, they're actually an electric motorcycle brand. So when you think about motorcycles, you don't typically think about being electric, but this is again, another example of a, a company that's disrupting the market. And so I love to talk about this brand and what they were able to deliver with Drupal. So Livewire really wanted to deliver a media rich, engaging experience on their site that captured the vision of their brand. And if you've ever looked at their website before, uh, for the 
person in the back who's familiar, they have a pretty cool website that does actually do what they set out to do. But they were challenged because their previous site was built with a ton of custom code, making it incredibly challenging for their content editors and content authors to make updates to content. There were a lot of bottlenecks, there was a heavy reliance on the developer team, and that just created friction across their organization. So by shifting to a headless implementation, Livewire was able to integrate Drupal into two different versions of their site. And there were two really big impacts that, that came out of this. Uh, they were able to increase their overall site performance, so you're not seeing a lag time and load, you're really making sure that you're not seeing a bounce rate, that your people that are coming to your site are going to stay on your site, and you're also boosting that customer experience and satisfaction as a second, uh, secondary win and benefit from that. So the teams were able to leverage Drupal's API-first uh, strategy and framework to take a content-as-a-service approach, seamlessly integrating the powerful Drupal CMS into their existing front-end web application. And like I said, if you've gone to the website, feel free to pull out your phones once we head out of the session. Just take a look at their site, scroll through. It's super engaging. Uh, they were able to reach their goal that they had set out to embrace their brand and make sure that they were conveying their brand across their digital landscape. But they were also allowed to break down, or they were also able to break down those silos. And when we think about the content editor, the content creator, it's super important that they have the access that they need to optimize content. When they know content is performing, they want to repurpose and reuse that content. So how do we put the power back in their hands to enable them to drive really meaningful impacts that impact that customer journey? So hugely innovative in their own industry, but innovative in how they use Drupal in terms of leveraging a headless decoupled solution, but breaking down those silos and removing friction internally so that developers had time to do the things that they want to do, which is focus on innovation, focus on cool projects, focus on testing new technology and figuring out how they can work that into their own ecosystem. And the results here that Livewire drove, pretty impactful as well. They had a one month implementation, fantastic, on time, wonderful, we love to see that. And they were also able to launch five global sites in just one, th one month as well. And then my favorite stat from them is that they actually launched a pre-order page for one of their new uh, bikes that they were releasing into market. That bike sold out in minutes. So we're seeing real business impact from leveraging headless Drupal, from being able to give the power back to the content editors and allow your developers to really do what they're meant to do. And lastly, we'll talk about Leica Geosystems. Uh, they're the leading manufacturer of precision laser technology for measurements in a wide array of architecture and construction projects. So Leica's challenge was that their e-commerce store was active in multiple countries uh, and needed to be translated into multiple languages. So when you think about what that looks like, it's a multi-site initiative managing you know, multiple sites with all the complexities that come along with that. But what was really challenging for Leica was that their product, content, and pricing changed dramatically across those sites in terms of currencies and in terms of you know, sales, et cetera. So it was a very dynamic site with very dynamic content. And the challenge was really to make that content and product management easier for the Leica team and support the opportunity to expand into new markets, uh, expand into you know, new areas of the world and be able to support the teams to be able to do so easily. Their specific requirements were that they would need to sort 10 countries with a regional, a global regional perspective as well, six different languages, and they had and leveraged tons of third-party integrations, which is something that we hear all the time. Uh, and it's something that you know, Drupal is very strong at. So a move to Drupal in combination with some smart choices in terms of module support and customization simplified many aspects of what the Leica team was looking to achieve. They focused in on configuration management, one database to rule them all, one commerce install for multiple stores, one page in multiple countries with multiple languages, which was humongous for team efficiency, and they were able to future-proof and achieve longevity with Drupal. And what they were able to achieve was that they were able to, leveraging the built-in commerce functionality, deliver highly, custom highly customized uh, and fantastic experiences for the Leica Geosystem teams. 
it was imperative that their commerce was their commerce back end be able to be accessible by their marketing front end and the third party services that they had chosen to work with were all accessible within the Drupal ecosystem, making that extensibility very simple with minimal custom code needed. And finally, for a global brand looking to expand into new markets, they were able to leverage the state of the art translation system in Drupal that is provided out of the box. So when you think about somebody who has a multi-site challenge with a global reach, that multi-site and multilingual uh, benefit Drupal provides is really impactful. So a couple of different customers doing a couple of different things and innovating in industries that we may not hear or think of very often. But I think this is a really great opportunity to see the impact of the innovation that Drupal drives across a wide set of verticals and a wide set of pro projects uh, and driving some really impact impactful value to business and to team members across marketers and content creators as well as developers. So to summarize, we've taken a look back through time, we've taken a look at the market, we've taken a look at Drupal and innovative moments, and we've taken a look at some customers. But let's talk about what's upcoming, what is exciting, what's new, what can you get involved in, and how do you get involved, because that's the best next step for you. So I know we've all heard and probably played around with ChatGBT by OpenAI, and I know that I oftentimes will try to play with ChatGPT and I'm told, you know, I'm, I'm not able to access, a, it's too high performance, so I have to come back later. But any time I can get my hands on it and play around with it, it's super cool. And I like to say ChatGPT really is the new kid on the playground that everybody wants to play with, and so it's just in super high demand. Uh, but Dries mentioned this in the Dries note yesterday, if you were able to join, uh, showed a demo of what ChatGPT is able to deliver. But I think this is a really good opportunity to highlight what is going on in terms of innovation with AI for Drupal. So there's a lot of discussion around what this means for you know, not just Drupal, but for the CMS market, for the world as a whole. Um, but Valir specifically jumped right in with some foundational features that they felt would enhance ChatGBT specifically for Drupal. So OpenAI provides a handful of services to integrate with the API. And specifically, they focus on generating text, generating images, analyzing text, and running moderation, scoring on that text, and then fine tuning the models. But Valir was able to focus on five key features and really drill down into what those five key features should be for the first iteration of this module. And the, the features, I'll go through a little bit one by one, what it is and why it's impactful. So the first is Prompt Text Generation Explorer. So what it is, if anyone has interacted with ChatGBT, anytime you type into the little box at the bottom, you're prompting ChatGBT to talk with you. It's how us humans talk to AI. So why does that matter? It actually provides an opportunity for someone to leverage and prompt ChatGPT right in your workflow. No more switching back and forth between the platform and your Drupal site. The second is content generation. And what this is specifically, I've included a short video for you so you can get hands-on view. Um, it actually allows you to generate content for any content type that has a title and body field and generate images for detected image fields. Why does this matter? Well, actually generating random content is super helpful for people like myself who oftentimes get writer's block. So if I'm able to just drop in a quick prompt and say, I need some bullet points on how to make lunch today. It's gonna start to spur that creativity. It's going to start to give you a starting point where you can really get into the flow, get into your creativity and deliver meaningful content without having to waste all that time getting over your writer's block. So the third is CK Editor integration. Uh, what it is, it's a button in the CK Editor that lets you ask OpenAI or ChatGPT a question and retrieve text back. Why does this matter? Well, it can be used for content editing when you want to have a quick one-liner or an introduction. If you're looking for a quick snippet for a header, uh, it's really great for that use. Uh, and it also helps with writing and getting those prompts flowing uh, and really helping you to fine tune that content rather than starting from scratch. The fourth is log analysis. What is it? It's a log viewer in Drupal that uses OpenAI to explain, if you will, the error that you're seeing. So for somebody who, like myself, is not 
a technical user, so to speak, it helps me do some troubleshooting around what the error might be so I can work to overcome that error. Uh, this proof of concept, like I said, is really geared to those non-technical users, so a great way to expand Drupal users into that non-technical site builder marketer persona. And last, text embeddings. So when content is published, it's analyzed by OpenAI and has a series of vector data returned. Essentially, the embeddings feature measures the relatedness of strings. Why does this matter? Well, these calculations will actually help to augment other parts of the system, and they can be used as a means for bolstering search and relevancy, in addition to using alongside popular modules like Search API. So again, this is really about simplifying that content creation process and driving more meaningful and seamless experiences. So, the Lear is welcoming anyone in the community to join and develop features alongside their team. So a great opportunity to jump in, get your hands you know, on the module itself to do some testing, to do some playing around. Um, you can download and view the integration module on the project page in Drupal, on drupal.org. Um, and if you're using OpenAI and you have some really innovative ideas about how you can put it into practice, Valir wants to know. So I'd say reach out to them, have a chat, they want to make it happen, they want to bring people's ideas to life. So a great opportunity to get into the AI space and work on something that you know five, ten years from now may really have changed the world and you would have been at the forefront of that innovation. Drupal 10.1.0 release. Dries talked about this a little bit yesterday. I just want to touch on it following uh, his presentation and just acknowledge that this is a humongously feature-rich minor version upgrade uh, with, a, again, a focus on innovating the product as a whole and providing that foundation for us to build upon. So a handful of the features in the release are single directory components, menus exposed at link, as link sets for decoupled Drupal sites, streamlined content modeling experience, increased flexibility for block and page management, automated accessibility testing added to core, and a number of others. And this is just a small subset of what's being released in 10.1.0. So I'd say get in there, understand what's being released, get onto drupal.org and learn, but it's coming soon. So we do have uh, a beta available today as of May 15th, and betas are a great opportunity for the technical minded, the developers in the room to get their hands on technology before it is released uh, to the public. So if you have uh, experience with bug testing and even fixing those bugs, Drupal wants you to get involved uh, and really put your hands on the products so that we can find and enhance everything before everything goes live. So I'd say learn all you can about 10.10. There's a lot going on, a lot of innovation and development, uh, and jump in before you know the next couple weeks as it's released. And then Project Browser, which I talk about internally all of the time. It's one of my favorite things to talk about right now. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, Project Browser, Browser really gives you the ability to browse, filter, and install modules that you need for your projects. And I love this quote from Dries that he says, the Project Browser makes it easy for site builders to find and install modules. And you'll note here that he calls out the site builder. And we've talked about the site builder. Dries announced this persona back in Portland, DrupalCon 2022. Um, we did some a little bit more of a deep dive this year, but this persona is super interesting to me uh, because they are technically minded, but they're not a developer. They do have you know ability to work in the command line, but they aren't necessarily comfortable doing that, and they would prefer to work in the UI. So this is a, definitely an evolving persona, and to have Drupal innovation and development that's focusing on that persona specifically is really fantastic. So one of the first things a new user in Drupal will do is they'll go to discover modules. And they will sometimes get lost, sometimes have to leave the site and do some research. And they may not necessarily be comfortable identifying you know, what it means around bugs within a module or you know, have the wherewithal to understand how that could impact the site that they're building. And that may actually deter them from using Drupal. So having the ability to leverage Project Browser to easily discover and then install those modules in a safe way will help grow the Drupal community and expand to more of those ambitious site builders, those marketers, those content authors, and you know, break out into new verticals or even you know, align to more projects. And so I think this is a very exciting project. And 
Project Browser is, is something that I would definitely want to get involved in. Uh, the team is currently looking to fill additional roles within the project, specifically around developers, site builders, and documenters. Uh, the initiative leads appointed by Dries are Chris Wells and Leslie Ginn. Glenn, if you want to reach out to them directly to have some chats. Uh, and it's also available in the Project Browser channel on Drupal Slack. Their meetings are every Tuesday and Wednesday, so very engaging. They want everyone to get involved, everyone to contribute. And I like to say that the more diverse perspectives you can get into the room when Drupal is focusing on an innovation like this, the better off we're going to make the delivery of that solution moving forward. So I'd say check it out, more info on the Project Browser page on Drupal.org, but another great opportunity to get involved in. Now, we've covered a lot. We have a couple minutes left, so if anyone does have any questions, I'd love to open up the floor. But I just want to thank you all for joining, sitting with me, learning. I want to learn from you all. So if you have any recipes for me, if you have any innovative projects that you're working on, I'll be here. I'll be uh, at our Acquia Expo booth uh, for the rest of the time. But thank you all. I'm very excited to continue to be a part of this community, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Any questions, feel free to raise your hand if we're a little shy or quiet. I know I'm most of the session before lunch, so I don't blame you if you want to run and beat the line. I have a question. Yeah? So I can tell um, I'm hearing a lot about the open web at this whole time, which I really appreciate the thing that means a lot to me. And I identify the Mozilla Foundation and Firefox with that open web space. Have you seen any evidence that like the Drupal Association, Acquia, may be considering like partnering with Mozilla Foundation? So just to repeat the question for those who may not have heard or are watching the recording, the question is, open web has been a big topic of conversation at DrupalCon. Uh, how you know, we associate with Mozilla and Firefox in this realm specifically. So have we seen any developments or commitments from Drupal or Acquia to uh, plan commitments to this initiative as well. Uh, that's a great question. I think it's a super top of mind, especially here with you know everybody meeting in person finally again, and you know having the ability to lean on the incredible accessibility enhancements that Drupal has put out you know previously, and also as we look to implement that strategy moving forward as well. I would say in terms of commitments, I have not personally seen anything in writing, um, but I think it's definitely open for discussion. And if you have you know, opinions and feedback, I'd love to learn from you and hear what your perspective, perspectives would be so I can bring that back to our team. Uh, I know at our core, at, at Acquia, you know, accessibility as a part of the Drupal community is part of our DNA. And it's something that we are highly focused on in terms of just making sure that everybody has access to the web and everybody has the ability to do so in a way that feels safe and comfortable for them. So while I haven't seen official commitments, um, if you have any you know, recommendations, I'd love to learn and, and hear from you and bring that back to our team. No problem. Any other questions? I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why nobody's asking questions, but um, my question is related to the progressive decoupling method. Um, I find that speaks much more towards the solutions that I'm, like towards the problems I'm finding at my company in the financial industry. Maintenance is like, ridiculous amount of responsibility to meet all these requirements. And the fact is we have a large developer base that works in Node.js, React, um, JavaScript apps, and we even have a design system that is basically tailored towards that. Um, and they are constantly trying to use our Drupal solutions, because we also fully support Drupal on all of our public facing websites. Trying to use our Drupal solutions um, and then use fully decoupled and then having all these maintenance headaches because they're managing their own maintenance on their other servers. How do I, like, I don't know, how do I sell them on this progressively decoupling idea? You don't need to launch nine servers, you know, to run your React app. You can still just use our single pipeline of Drupal, get a full, you know, React app experience. Uh, but I'm just struggling with making that kind of like sale to them, 
and they only just keep adding to our you know maintenance responsibilities. And, um, so, is there any uh, advice you can have on? Because I see that as our solution, but I, I can't convey to the people making these decisions how to choose it. Yeah, that's a great question. That is also a very deep question, um, and I do want to be cognizant of time. We are one minute over, so I'd love to chat with you one-to-one. Okay. -one. We can dive into more of your specific use case. I couldn't possibly try to reiterate that question live to the group, um, but if anybody wants to join that conversation, happy to have that as a one-off as well. Um, but thank you all. I appreciate it. Enjoy lunch, and feel free to find me later on today, tomorrow, to have a quick chat. <laughs>